All right, we're live. Welcome to the second philosophy of lack with uh, myself, OG Rose, Tim Adlin, Alex Ebert. Um, in the first philosophy of lack, we were discussing the origin of philosophy, really, starting with Parmenides and the notion of absolute being, um, sort of being the way in which philosophy grounds a type of banishing of the void. Um, a banishing of lack, and then sort of situated our conversation as a type of inversion of philosophy to talk about um, sort of how there's this feeling in being of something missing, and there's this feeling in being of like a, a, a void that is important to get in touch with, that's important to be in conversation or dialogue with. Um, and in this conversation, hopefully we can extend that that dialogue, this time using a different ancient world philosopher as a jumping off point, um, we're going to be sort of discussing uh, Democritus. Uh, Democritus is often used as a philosopher um, who was capable of thinking uh, atoms. Um, he is often noted as the philosopher who first proposes the logical concept of the atom. Um, and of course, has a lot more credibility today, given that um, we have sort of an empirical verification of the existence of atoms, um, and in some ways now is seen as the sort of um, the sort of unofficial philosopher of scientific materialism. You know, proposing this idea that fundamentally we live in a universe um, of atoms and the void. Let's say. Um, we live in a universe uh, that is at base divided between some indivisible substance known as atoms and nothing, the void. Um, the interesting thing about this philosophy to me is, I guess, twofold. On the one hand, um, I think it's really interesting that there's an ancient world philosopher whose ontology syncs up so well with modern physics and syncs up so well with with scientific materialism. Um, and then on the other hand, um, it's interesting that because in some sense, scientific materialists um, don't really dig deeply into philosophy, um, there are some nuances and paradoxes of Democritus as a philosopher um, that I think are left unthought in the scientific materialist universe. And I think like the most important dimension of that thought is the fact that Democritus was not just a philosopher of the atom, but also a philosopher of the void in some sense. You know, like uh, he's basically saying that uh, the void is a precondition for atoms, is a necessary condition for atoms. Like with, without, without the void, you, you, you wouldn't have a sort of a non-medium or, or an absent background for the atoms to be indivisible particles. Um, and that's interesting because when you think about scientific materialism, you're thinking about a worldview that is biased towards material. You're thinking about a worldview that is biased towards the presence of something as opposed to the absence of something. So it seems like there's a dimension of this atoms in the void notion, which um, is just unthought. And I think it would be interesting to explore it philosophically because um, in some sense, it might be the most interesting way to approach a philosophy of science today because the traditional way in which people attack scientific materialism is usually not with the void, but usually usually people say science opens up the void, but it, it's rather that people sort of combat scientific materialism by proposing some sort of new age substance, some supernatural substance, something more. Um, whereas I think if we take this philosophical direction, actually we're saying science has to think something less. It's rather a subtraction of matter as opposed to the addition of some supernatural substance. Um, can science think absence? Can science think void? Um, I think that this is coming up in some quantum mechanical circles, um, specifically among some philosophers and physicists who are trying to think David Bohm's work. You know, you have this idea that instead of looking up at the night sky and focusing on the presence of stars, you look up at the night sky and think about the 
um, the black background of the night sky and, 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 and just sort of thinking about, again, this condition of absence as sort of a, a, a sort of a, a condition of possibility for the presence of stars. Um, so that's sort of like where I've seen it come up the most directly, let's say. Um, but then when we go deeper into Democritus' philosophy, um, he's also sort of saying that when we think about what is most real, and of course, philosophers are always kind of interested in that question, what is most real? What is most true? Um, he also sort of says that um, the because of atoms in the void, the most essential can be neither of those, but somehow the paradox of the two. Like somehow... Th the, the the condition of fundamental reality being atoms in the void um, must mean that there's something about the interaction between atoms and the void or some other third category um, which is more fundamental than atoms in the void. So I hope that's sort of clear about like where I want to go with this, but like basically it's it's the, if I could summarize it, it's like the boldness to not be against science in any way, um, but also say that there's something about the philosophical foundation of science which um, has been left unthought, almost as like a historical mistake, almost like a, a historical mistake being that like, because science is so often positioned in relationship or antagonism with religion, which proposes a type of supernatural substance, there's kind of like this um, unthought assumption that all we need is a materialist philosophy and that philosophy is kind of now obsolete. You know, the, probably the most famous expression of this obsolete philosophy is the, you know, the expression of someone like a Stephen Hawking who would say, you know, philosophy is obsolete now, physicists can just take over. Um, but like what I'm basically saying here is that what science hasn't approached is the fact that their metaphysics depends on nothing, um, which is not a material, um, but something that is sort of the background condition for material. Um, and I guess before I pass it on to you, OG, I would just propose one more last thing, which is that it seems to me that if we connect this discussion to our first discussion, that thinking absence, thinking nothing, thinking lack actually is necessary for us to exist in a scientific universe and also think subjectivity. So that what I would propose is that what's on the line with this philosophy of lack and scientific materialism is the capacity to think the subject within the universe of science. And, and that, that's, that's, that's where I, I, I would maybe point, but, but mm. um, let me pass it on to you, OG, and, and let's get this going. Well, thank you, Cadell. Gentlemen, it's lovely to see you again. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, you know, Democritus always blows my mind. You know, I sometimes wonder if we wouldn't have lost all of his books if instead of talking about the pre-Socratics, we may talk about the uh, post-Democritus uh, thinkers because, you know, I think he wrote on music, he wrote on geography, all these different things, and we just have fragments. I think this guy also, like, predicted there were other planets. He predicted that the stars were like the sun. I mean, this is totally crazy. And uh, so it was, it was quite a genius. And, and also, too, what's interesting to me is that he was known as the, he was cheerful. You know, he always talks about the cheerful philosopher and something like that. And if indeed at the heart of um, Democritus's uh, ontology is some sort of mixture of uh, lack and something, then there's an integration of lack, which just kind of points back to the conversation last time, how an integration with lack, actually far from making you nihilistic and miserable, actually sets you up to be cheerful. And it reminds me of Kafka and how he tell his stories and everyone would laugh. You know, Deleuze talks about that, Percy, and how this is, um, it's kind of funny because maybe one of the reasons why we have privileged being is because talks of void and different things like that, we think is going to have a negative psychological impact on us. But what's so funny is some of the um, people that are associated with uh, nihilism and so forth and so on are cheerful. Um, you know, there's something also I was thinking about when I was reading Democritus. So, so the void, which is not nothing, uh, is um, the, the void is the potentiality space for being. Whereas if there is no void, atoms, if 
you know, the atoms are going around and there are little hooks and they bump into each other and they make things and then they find other hooks and, they, and it builds and builds. Well, if there's no void, nothing can move. Uh, everything is stuck. Everything is stagnant. And so the void is a necessary precondition for existence to come into being. And if it is not there, well, then everything is stagnant. So the void has a very critical role in there being movement, in there being development, in there being a movement. And if we're tying this up to our last conversation, well, we talked all about how lack has a critical role in um, development of ourselves that we build and go forward. So you see that kind of in the structure metaphorically of what um, Democritus is discussing. And then I was thinking about it more and more. It's really interesting to me, you know, when we talk about the Big Bang, you know, nothing is something we come out of. We escape it, ex nihilo, out, creation out of nothing. Or we talk about the edge of the, you know, dark matter is outside the universe. So there's this perpetual othering of nothing, this othering of this void, this making it other. From being we're getting out of it and so then there can be the sense of any discussion of bringing back nothing is it's almost like uh, inviting the virus back into the or the system or it's um this unwelcome intruder is coming back and we're like no no no, we got to push that out because we got out of nothing we escaped nothing and how it's interesting i i, I guess since i do so much in literature you know how they talk about like in a, in a um, detective show, you know, you follow the evidence, you know, where does the evidence lead? I always think it's funny because you can kind of follow the language and see where the language leads. So we talk about, you know, that the, um, the universe comes out of nothing. Well, what are terms associated with nothing? It doesn't matter, valueless. You know, if it's nothing, we say that's nothing means it doesn't have value. We mean um, it doesn't have power. It's not something significant. So we use all of this language that contributes to a not needing to think about the void or the nothing that being came out of it because it's valueless, it doesn't matter, it's it's outside of us and it's other. And how, um, if it is indeed the case, as we discussed last time, that um, integrating with lack is critical so that we need nothing, and if we need what is infinity, it's something that needs nothing, as Mr. Ebert was discussing, then all that othering of nothering in our language, all of those connotations are greatly going to contribute to not integrating ourselves uh, with nothing, uh, and certainly science won't because if it, because uh, it's nothing. That's what we've gotten out of. It would almost be a sense where if science took seriously the void, it would be a, a regression. It would be going back <laughs> to that thing that we escaped. It would be inviting what's supposed to be outside inside. So then methodologically and, uh, and in our thinking, there's a bias not to do that. And how if it is the case, to, to finish my point and then pass it to Tim, um, if it is the case that we do indeed need some sort of integration with black, uh, well, then all of this would have practical consequences and it would contribute to us not doing so. And I do think you see in um, Democritus more of an understanding of um, the void as a necessary condition for there to be movement of being, for the building of being, for things to come into existence. And if you don't, and far from a background, I mean, that's how we treat the void, right? Like it's a background. And in a sense, it's a background. Uh, but if I have a table here, and I have my dinner on the on a plate on the table. You know, if I was saying, well, the table's not necessary. Nah, I couldn't eat my food if the table wasn't there. It's holding it up. It's supporting it. It's making possible for me to sit down. So likewise, you have to have that void to even make uh, materiality possible. But we we've othered it. We've treated it as an other, and therefore something we don't need to concern ourselves with. Oh, he's muted. Here we go. There you go, Tim. 10 out, of, 10 out of 10 beginning. It's good to be back with you all. Uh, I was listening to the conversation we had last time, last night, to prepare for this. And I was struck by how much I enjoyed listening to all of you guys. And I've resolved to speak for a little less time today to keep that flow going. It's a really tough thing to think about. Um, and uh, obviously, thinking about nothing in the context of science lack in the context of science if we take the the image that's behind our faces at the moment we have here i believe it's the highest resolution i don't know if resolution is the right word to use um image of the smallest particles or atoms or whatever we've ever we've ever seen or been able to make available to image in this way and you know our eyes are attracted to the light and then maybe the formation of the particles 
And when we look over to the space between, all of a sudden now I've used the word space to describe it, space being something that we can um, relate to by means of measurement, like extension, for example, all of a sudden we can um, have an abstraction of it in that way. Of course, when we do science, we're looking to verify stuff so we can try and get a sense of what exists in some corroborated way. And we've got to be able to observe it. And then the phenomenon has got to repeat so we can make the observation again and employ our tools of measurement and all of a sudden um, reckon a something out of whatever it is we're investigating. And so already we've sort of... Um, violated the mode of thinking we're trying to engage in about the the subject in question so one of the things i'm um trying to wrap my mind around for this conversation is just the frame of consideration i should be i should be bringing to bear um it seems like um from the subjective perspective that it seems that that would be for me the, the the novel way to approach this i can't really comment too much about about physics or how else to approach things in that way so in that sense a big pinch of salt but from the perspective of subjectivity can relate to what you're saying daniel about in the feeling of at least what it is to have somewhere to expand into and again i want to say space to expand into but I kind of wonder if even in thinking in terms of space, again, violates the mode of consideration we're really trying to get to. So perhaps a consideration of time then um, from the subjective perspective, uh, reckoning with the quality of consciousness unfolding, that relationship to potential, in that sense of relationship to grow into become into all of a sudden this sort of language begins to have relevance it's probably quite a bit more i could say on this but at least to begin with just noting some of the challenges of approaching lack from the traditional scientific method point of view is worthwhile and a turn towards subjectivity again as with last week to consider the phenomena of lack and to consider, therefore, what sort of metaphysics um, are really required to reckon with the the total of of reality that we are that we are here with. Uh, it need not be a full scale. Um, you know, th there's plenty of room for an integration of science with this picture. It's just sort of like there are certain. Um, there are certain uh, aspects of reality that are amenable to that particular epistemic process. And we, I think, best not um, confuse the application of that process to, to all phenomena, which is in some sense quite a trivial, quite a trivial point. So over to you, Alex. All right, uh, can you guys hear me? Um, yeah, it's fun listening to you all. It's good to be back. Uh, all right. So, so in the context of, uh, atoms and the formation of the, or the constitution of existence, <clears throat> let's see how to, uh, how to start. Okay. First of all, the very notion that, um, that the universe is composed of differential elements that comprise a totality means that those differential elements need one another to comprise the totality. Necessity implies lack. If I need something, I lack something. That means that each one of these differential elements that comprise the totality lack one another. And that it is that exact lack 
that actually provides the glue to the totality. So that's that's the first um, thing. And then with regard to the negative space, you know, it's not a Euclidean static background. It's not a nothing in that sense. Nothing, true nothing exists only in one place. True zero exists only in one place. And that is in fucking computers and in our heads. You cannot find actual zero in nature. Everything makes noise. Phonons crackle, atoms hum a B note, the note B, the earth hums at B flat, uh, gravitons hum. So everything in, in music, we call that the noise floor. What people call silence, we call the floor because the whole point of being in the studio and having a quiet room is to lessen the floor, but you can never get rid of the floor. Everyone's like, oh, you got the noise floor. So, you know, like it's all about the noise floor and what's the noise floor to waveform ratio. But one is the ground, one is the nothing. And then the other is the expression, the thing that you notice more. And, um, the reason why I think it's important to note the inherent dynamism within nothing is that, again, back to this equation that I just can't let go of, which is negative x. So negative x is the lack. I, I'm missing something. My This atom is missing all the other atoms, ne and negative x plus x, now I have the thing, equals zero. The only thing, zero, the thing that exists only in consciousness. Equilibrium. The completion is zero, which is perfect because it's a zero, it's a complete thing, but the completion of lack is zero, is equilibrium, which means to me... <laughs> to get magical for a second, that each one of these little atoms experience a lack that brings them to equilibrium, wherever that equilibrium is, and then, importantly, experience another lack that brings them to a heightened complexity, that brings them into a, you know, a tree, into a world, into a, a multicellular organism. Um, and I find that compelling, that lack, this idea of necessity, of needing to bond, is what brings these differential elements together and ends up building complexity and life. Um, and so I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll hand it back off to you, Kadel. All right. Um, so like the first thought that I have is, is related to how OG framed Democritus as a speculative genius, because it's like, maybe even points towards the interestingness of speculative thought, because it's, it's like, on the one hand, it's like, this guy's exists thousands of years ago. Um, with no modern technology, with no sort of buildup of scientific knowledge, um, and is capable just through speculative genius to anticipate the structure that of the universe that we've conform, con confirmed through empirical observation. So it's it's almost like that. It almost signals to me that there's something about a real thinker and there's something about almost like the fundamental nature of subjectivity that 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 must that must be somehow connected to the fundamental nature of things to be able to just through speculative reason itself deduce something of that um with that precision you know it, it's it's just it's just it's just remarkable um, 
And it, it just it, it 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 just reminds it just reminds me of the power of philosophy, and it just reminds me of sort of the need to again think in a philosophical way about fundamental scientific questions of our time. Because like I feel like one of the main cultural features of 20th century science is this sort of view that physics can just sort of take over and we don't need any more philosophical speculative thinking anymore. And I think that that's sort of like why I think this conversation is, is, is important and, and just to have it open. Um, and then the next thing that comes to my mind is actually something that Tim said about science and the way in which science sort of defaults to represent things in space sort of defaults to represent defaults to representation um, of spatial extension of being. Um, and I think about my own scientific career. So like when I think about my scientific career and I think about like, you know, my first writings or my first publications, I can't help but notice that everything I write and everything I'm interested in is my thought being constrained by a substance of some kind. So I, I you know, for example, and I, and I tried to like think everything, but this thinking everything is always the thought of something as a spatial representation. So, so I'm, I'm trying to think planets. I'm trying to think galaxies. I'm trying to think organisms. I'm trying to think chemical chem chemistry. I'm trying to think people. I'm trying to think civilization, history. But all of these things are sort of spatial representations of something. Um, it, it, it's, it's the representation of being, but what it kind of misses, and I think this is so interesting and, and and being discussed being discussed now definitely which is basically the fact that actually describing a certain given being doesn't allow you to explain the genesis of that being or the becoming of that being so there's the possibility to mechanically describe what what i'm trying to say is there's with the scientific materialism, there's a capacity to describe the mechanics of what is. And our capacity within science to describe the mechanics of what is is very powerful. But it kind of leaves unthought the why it exists and the potential of its existence. So we have a default to describing how something works, but not why something is in being or the potential of that being to sort of to sort of repeat that. And, and I think that that is interesting in the context of 21st century science, because in 21st century science, we're no longer simply describing physics. We're no, not, we're no longer simply describing chemistry. We're no longer simply describing biology. We're creating biology. We're, we're, we, we have the capacity to create chemical elements. We have the capacity to play around with new physics. So that to me means that scientists need to think why something comes into being. And scientists need to think about the potentiality of what that something is that they're bringing into being is. Maybe artificial intelligence is a perfect example of that. You know, like when we create artificial intelligence, that's not just merely a spatial representation of something that exists in being. We're talking about something that we are bringing into being and that has a radically unknown potentiality. The same thing goes for genetic engineering. The same thing goes for atomic manufacturing. 
you know, Eric Drexler talks about atomic manufacturing where we can just play around with the fundamental subatomic structure like it's our playground and build things from the atom up. You know, like, like that asks us to ask the question, why do we bring something into being? And what is its potential again? So I guess before I pass it on to OG, I'll just end with a reflection on what Alex was saying about how lack, and I think this is like really interesting thought. I really like Alex's thought here on lack, which is that lack provides a glue to the totality and that without lack, there would be no need to bond. So it's kind of like you need to, know, so like what I'm trying to get at is why you would bring something into being would kind of be um, asking us as scientists to reflect on what types of bonds do we need? And what type of material structure would we want to produce in order to facilitate the formation of those bonds? Um, and again, yeah, before I pass it on, just to sort of like reflect on how pragmatic and how um, sort of mainstream pop culture that question is, I would just like to like reflect on something that Esther Perel, who's a relationship expert, said about her experience in Silicon Valley. So for anyone who doesn't know Esther Perel, she's basically taking over uh, sort of like a big space in our popular discourse about modern relationships. And she'll go around to, you know, basically tech companies and different digital startup companies and like talk about modern relationships. And she'll say, what's interesting is that when you go to like, for example, a conference at Google about the future, you'll have, you know, the future of robots, the future of AI, the future of computers, but never have conversations about the future of relationships or the future of sexuality. Like that will be missing. That will be lacking. But she's saying like, like, like that kind of brings it around to what Ebert's saying about like on the physical level, lack is the precondition to needing to bond and science can't think lack. So it doesn't think relationships in this way, you know, like it, it, it it's, it's, I think it, you know, I think this is really practical stuff. So hopefully that was like a clear, like way to sort of tie all the things that we've been saying together, but uh, I'll pass that to you, OG. No, that was outstanding, Goodell. And no, I just finished a book, I guess, uh, by Fukuyama on gene editing and the gene stuff that's coming. And for me, you know, um, a good novel, a good story has to have stakes. If there's no stakes, you don't care. One of the reasons this conversation has stakes is because those technologies are coming and we are going to be able to gene edit and to do all the things that you're describing. And if we don't have a why, if we don't think about what actually matters, probably not going to go so well. So there's real stakes. Um, you were also discussing the role of spec speculation. Um, there's a book I think uh, Green Black called The Swerve. I know he's kind of controversial because his depiction of medieval culture, people think is really bad. But generally the book is about how On the Nature of Things by Lucretius, I think was discovered. And had it not been discovered, it had such a big influence on Galileo, Darwin, Thomas Jefferson, all these different people because of its understanding of the movement basically of atoms and the swerve and how that made possible freedom and how it had a scientific conception of freedom. And had you not had that, the world would have formed very, very differently. And so it, it does make you wonder, had the library of Alexander not um, burned down and we had all that extra speculative thought, if science would have um, advanced quicker maybe or in, in different ways. I kind of now metaphorically want to associate um, the void, the, the, the void we've been discussing with speculation and the atoms with science that uh, the speculation is how the atoms can move around and kind of come up with new things. And it also reminds me, I always 
Um, I guess from that Isaacson biography on Einstein, rather it's the, the best of the best, I, I don't know. But you know, he, he kind of points out how one of the reasons Einstein was so amazing wasn't necessarily that he was the greatest at math, because uh, I think actually on some of the more complex math, and correct me if I'm wrong, you'd have to bring in like Lorenzo and some of his friends. But what he had was that unique ability to be sitting on a train, look at it, back at a clock tower and say, I wonder what that looks like at the speed of light. Or he'd look out a window and be like, you know, if you were following, falling in an elevator completely of glass, dude, would you even know you were falling? Like these sort of questions, these speculative questions that then boom, the science could uh, could 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 play. So right there, um, what we see in um, the Democritus is you don't have a competition between void and atom, right? It's not a hierarchy. There's a necessary relationship of these things. And I'm a, you know, I say it all the time that metaphors matter and our metaphor thinking is a big deal. If indeed we view um, nothing, as in some way less than something, as something we, nothing as what we escape and want to be free of, then metaphorically, uh, the way we approach the world will be one of a hierarchy, not one of integration. And so then it won't be by chance that we think in terms of what's more important, philosophy or science? What's more important? The humanities or the hard science? All of that kind of metaphorically follows from our ontological uh, structure of which is more important as opposed to going, well, made it, wait, wait a minute, Maybe um, speculative thought is the um, background <laughs> upon which the uh, atoms of science can move. And if it wasn't there, they wouldn't couple together in some of the different ways that they, they otherwise could. And if indeed a book like The Swerve is correct, uh, if indeed is the case that it is Einstein's imagination is so critical, there would be reason to think that indeed uh, speculative thought is as such in, in its importance. Um, I was also thinking about what Ebert was saying. It, it reminds me, there's always been in uh, theology, this dilemma of why in the world would God create? You know, because if he's complete and if he's total, why would you create anything, right? Because the whole reason you would create, it would be because you lack, you know, the only thing is you would have a lack. And so there's been all this kind of trying to square the circle of like, well, God in his very essence creates, it flows out of him. He can't help it because you don't want to use the language in theology of need need, because if you say God needs, then he's not complete. So there's always been this sort of dilemma that you have to, to figure out because exactly right. The, the, the whole reason you have different because difference inherently means there's some sort of lack. And in theology, not wanting to, uh, to, to say that God has a lack, but also then wanting to explain how we could come into existence, you get things like negative theology. You get the not nothing. You have, uh, you know, there was that whole Princeton debate on Karl Barth on God's essential nature and so forth and so on. So there's a theological um, uh, background. There's a history of trying to wrestle with that dilemma you're describing that I find really, really fascinating. Um, and, and, and two, on the final thing I'll say before passing it to the lovely Tim uh, is that, and everyone watching should know that Tim got up the earliest to be here. So he's a saint. God bless you, Tim. Uh, you know, because of the part of the world he's in. Good man over there. Uh, is that, um, the idea that there's not nothing. Well, even in theology, where you say that God creates out of nothing, you always have to go, well, it's actually kind of a relative nothing because there was never, there's always God, there's always pure being the ground. So it's not an actual nothing, it's just nothing relative to us because we can't fully conceptualize it. So it's really kind of funny because when you go through thought, because even like, who's the thing? Is it Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss who did the book, um, A Universe from Nothing? You know, isn't it where they talk about, it's not really that there's nothing, but it's like, no, the reason something comes from nothing because nothing is unstable, I think is the famous line. And it's like, as long as you have, the uh, laws of the universe, you, nothing can be unstable and therefore will generate something. So really it's kind of funny because even as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm incorrect, uh, there, there really isn't a nothing. It, like you say, it's something in our head. Uh, it's something that we can exist here and project. And to close what I think is really interesting, how different would our view of nihilism, like how different would nihilism be if you really took seriously that nothing, when you use the term nothing, it's always a, a value judgment or it's always relative. If you really understood that nothing like real is actually always void or lack, and therefore it's a potentiality space of being, it's what makes movement possible, then maybe if uh, nausea, uh, nausea is the book that Sartre wrote, maybe, maybe at the end of that, when he's looking at the tree and he says, it's nothing, it's all nothing, instead of that being sort of a deconstructor, it would be like, possibility, you know, it'd be like the ground of all, but it would be more positive than it would, would be negative. So I've just been thinking about if how different nihilism would be uh, if you took Democritus seriously. And it also, what you were saying, Ebert, makes me think about love because everything has a love. It's like a movement, right? And it's building. And yet that love, if it, um, the love ends, if the lack goes away, 
that's also the joke, right? You know, we can talk about Hegel and Goodell. Everyone watching should know that Goodell's like lectures on Hegel are unbelievable. And so the, the lack can't go away to make the love uh, capable and, and it keeps pushing forward, like you're saying, keep pushing forward. Yeah, really liking these uh, processual themes coming through, this sort of relationship being emphasized between something and nothing, obviously these two <laughs> things what do you even call them require each other don't make sense without each other um very glad i'm finally in a place where getting up to do something at 6 30 is um rewarded with sainthood if only that had been the case during high school might have had a little bit more self-confidence um the i really like uh the comment about noise floors um, I think that's that's a really um, that's a really helpful frame for for relating to this. Um, I think what I'm about to say has already been um, has already been said, but um, it's it's kind of interesting to think about the absence we're postulating that we've confused ourselves about because that. The, the, the absolute void or absence is what I'm hearing as in some sense delusional. Um, we are even in relationship to our own postulation of that thing. And I consider from an evolutionary perspective that we are developed so as to recognize those things most relevant for us so the process of relevance realization to bring in john viveki and it just makes me think of the relationship to absence as one of blindness and how from an intersubjective perspective some of the questions i'd be asking are what are the kinds of context of shared exploration a kind of conditions for speculation conditions for seeing thinking feeling other than what is already locked and loaded so as to um, realize the openness of stance so as to more fully relate to potential something about the coming together of science and art in their turn in some sort of symphony of orchestration together um it does does strike me as weird that we have such separation between such profound modes of human inquiry into the nature of what is you know um yeah, the um, the book, The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse will speak about mathematics and music as, well, this is my language, but as kind of partners in a dance in some sense, you know, that the, the most fantastic turns played in their culture of, of Castilla, where they played in some sense improvis improvisational games that sought to incorporate the deepest insights of culture with a relationship to creation incorporated both mathematics and music and that's just it's just fascinating it's so utterly different from the gestalt experience of being a person at a university in whether an arts department or a scientific institution I remember going back to the University of Bristol after I finished my study there to meet a friend. And um, we took this wonderful walk through an old enchanted forest on some LSD. And then we came back and walked through the town and we were looking for a place to continue our chat. And there used to be this grad building um, that we do our work at. And it was an awesome old house, basically, that was reserved for the grad students. So we could go down to the basement whenever we wanted. Um, but I hadn't been back in some time and now it was shut down and they'd moved the grad students into what felt to me like um, a surgical 
environment. It felt like a hospital. And as I walked in, um, after having such a rich experience and continue to be having such a rich experience, I just felt, and you know, perhaps we could talk about my own neuroses and projection coming out, but man, I just felt so trapped in there. Like there's just the very air itself was preventative of genuine creativity um, and, and the kind of novel approach that ultimately has the capacity to um, reorient institutions and um, um, develop new institutions, you know. Um, that's what I'm feeling is happening here that we're involved in, you know, I'm trying to feel out the possibility of the development of new institutions, effectively new rhythms of gathering with structures enabling of not just speculation, but um, but certainly that's part of it. Um, these are some of the themes coming through and, and where I, and where ultimately I think the, the critical edge and implication of some of this conversation and many others like it sort of has to turn. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, just to mention what, what you were bringing up, Tim, before I forget. Um, it, it was probably mentioned last time, uh, but the creative process, in my experience, is um, very intimately related with lack, uh, with emptying, uh, emptying the vessel so that you can receive um, of course, implies a, a, the generative, the generative magnetism of lack. Um, lack is an invitation, um, and even that shitty new place that they sent they sent you to created a lack that was probably generative in some sense where it's like, this is not what I want. I want something else. And, um, you know, so yeah. Um, going back to science, just because I think it's, this is all science. Um, you brought up Einstein, OG. Uh, he, you know, he had this idea uh, about how to explain entanglement um, called hidden, hidden variables. It wasn't a formulated idea, hence the name hidden variables. He's like, well, what probably explains this are hidden variables. End, period. <laughs> but he did mention that a describer of what he thought the hidden variables would do. And they would make particles behave like, I think he, he, he used the, a familial term. I think he said behaved like family, like they know each other, the interrelation. And I want to bring up um, the idea of zero, of nothing, as not an absence of form necessarily, but actually as a compression of form that negates relation. So that nothing is actually the negation of relation as opposed to the negation of substance. But when you compress things enough, when they are together enough, when they are whole and completely one, they no longer have relation to one another. And that is how hypergravitational uh, forces work at the Planck scale. When you have a Planck star, a black hole, and you have that kind of compression, relation collapses. And all that was dis differential becomes unified. And you have nothing in that you have no relation. 
And so when we say something is born from nothing, we mean relation is born from non-relation. That expansion is born from a contraction. So that when these particles, after the expansion, are behaving as family, it's because they were the same thing. They were compressed in a non-relata space of Planck, spa Planck scale compression. And then once they've been dispersed, they still have that memory, that relata. They behave like family. They can behave like twins, you know, and, ex and, and exhibit what we experience as entanglement. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the hidden variable. Um, and again, this comes back to the idea of lack being that we were together and now we're apart. And we relate to one another because we were apart, are now apart. And guess what? At some point, some of us, clumps of us, are going to come back together because of the, the nature of black holes and the, and the nature of compression. Um, and by the way, re with regard to the noise floor um, in music, so you have, you have the noise floor, which looks like nothing, but it's actually something. Then you have the waveform, and we've all seen sonic waveforms. But when you take those waveforms and you compress them enough, when you take life, dynamism, and you compress it enough, you lift the valleys up to the peaks, that waveform if you zoom out, becomes a flat line. It becomes another noise floor, non-relata, no more relation. And that becomes the new nothing. And from that new nothing, then a new waveform, a new lack inspires a new waveform. So we've all experienced, for instance, um, I'll use a ridiculous example, like, you know, in a cartoon or something. I want love. I want love. Suddenly you have love and you have love. I love you so much. Boop, and suddenly you experience being smothered. Right? So a compression occurs where the love gets too much and it becomes a compression, a death. And now you need something else. Or, you know, you can transpose this idea of like compression, saturation of events that become nothing, that become non-relational, where you no longer feel the dynamism, you no longer feel the life. And then that from that no relation, from that you know mini example of zero relata, of, of no relation, of Planck star compression, but just in your life, from a compression of events, then you start a new waveform, something new. You have a new lack because you're experiencing too much. You've become bored or whatever it is, or you've slept enough so now you get to be awake and then you spend enough energy and now you have to go to sleep. So anyway, that, that like, I just wanted to sort of describe that relationship as a, a, an emergent relationship, you know, again, from like too much to not that, and then that creates zero relata and then new newness out of that. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Love it. So much there. <laughs> so rich. Too much. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, where to start other than that, I guess, like, what's coming through for me most strongly is this sort of almost in a roundabout way approaching the concept of love or the feeling of love somehow trying to situate that as central to this whole discussion about atoms in the void and science and the place of subjectivity and it's like it's a trippy thing thinking about love, especially as a scientist, because I can't think of any scientist, no matter how smart, no, no matter how clever, no matter how much they've mastered this, that, and the other thing, that they aren't somehow 
deeply perplexed by love. You know, like like love is is is, and I think OG said, you know, love here and movement are are deeply connected. What I want to give is a quote, actually, and it's a quote from Plato. This is from the symposium. Famous quote, very short, it starts, human nature was originally one and we were whole and the pursuit of the whole is called love, end quote. I just want to use that quote because it's sort of like the perfect philosophical parallel to the physics that Alex was describing. And like, I think like on some deep level, like I've always had this intuition that when Alex is playing around with physics, like we're very close to thinking something very similar. Cause I've, I've also kind of had this intuition to think in this direction, but it's like, Somehow there's some symmetry between what philosophers are trying to get at with love and what physicists are trying to get at with the unified field. And it's like, if we were, if we were one at one point and that this oneness that we emerged from and are somehow falling towards structures us. That means kind of like when you fall in love with someone, there is a way in which you become entangled with them. And like, there's this feeling I've had with entanglement where it's like, it's actually terrifying because it's like it's so out of your control it's like i'm not choosing to be entangled here but like i feel entangled and like i can't get out of the entanglement but it's like somehow and and it, and it, it's sort of like exactly what alex was saying is like you 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 feel smothered you feel like it's a death like you feel like it's this compression that you need to escape from. Like it's too much. And it, and, and it's, 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 it's even, it's like on, it's not physiologically suffocating. It's, it's mentally suffocating. It's like, like, I, I don't know. I just, I just feel that so, so strongly. And it's like, what is that? But other than that, like to sort of like, hopefully not be too vague and mystical, but it's like, when we when we mess around with love we're really messing around with something that's insanely powerful and i think that it's 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 like maybe even the major topic the major metaphysical thing to talk in this age of individualism because and especially the age of like modern dating apps and modern sort of like casual dating it's like there's this and here i'm just going to be channeling slavoj zizek but in the modern period it's really like we have this fear of falling in love because of this being smothered we have this fear of falling in love because of this compression because of this feeling of like being totally out of control with that, like that, that there's a force beyond us that is somehow more than us or somehow bigger than us that is controlling us. And, you know, what does that, what does that ultimately mean? Like, what does that, what does that ultimately mean? Especially when there's such a weird symmetry with thinking these ideas and thinking like, fundamental physics somehow, <laughs> you know, it's like, like, uh, like, are, are we, are we like, how deeply entangled are we as subjects with the fundamental nature of reality itself? Like, it seems to me like, like we're one in the same thing.
Like I don't, I don't see how a figure like Democritus can think atoms in the void just from pure speculative thought. If what he's, if what we're looking at isn't us somehow, <laughs> like, like, like I just, I just have this image of myself as a teenager fascinated with like the cosmic microwave background radiation of like the birth of the universe and thinking like somehow I'm just intuitively looking at myself. Like I'm just, I'm somehow like looking at my baby picture or something like that. Like, and I guess like the last thing I'll say before passing it on to OG is that my PhD thesis is titled global brain singularity. And it's this idea of approaching the technological singularity from the point of view of subjectivity. And my goal with that was kind of to take like the fact that we have in physics, this idea of a big bang singularity. And we take this idea in physics of a black hole singularity. And you have to take this idea in mathematics of singularities. And now this notion of singularity emerging in technological sphere. And it's like somehow if all of this is connected in some way that's far more complex than any human can think, it's like somehow the mystery of these singularities is related to human nature. Like somehow the nature of these singularities is related to our very questioning, our very speculation. And I guess the last thing I'll say before, like finally, again, finally passing it on is like, the paradox of absolute being and absolute nothing being just figments of our thought and having no ontological in itself is like the purest evidence of the antinomies of reason, like the fact that thought can think something impossible, but also a signal that we are a part of something absolute meaning that thinking absolute being and thinking absolute nothing is somehow important for like the fact that we can think that is somehow important for, I want to say the genesis of universes. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, it was really challenging to respond, to respond to that, but I hope I did justice. OG, go ahead. That was lovely, Cadell. Thank you so much. And again, it's so wonderful to speak with you fine people. Um, it's kind of what you're into. It's almost like there's a, you know how we talk in Forbach, there's the idea that you have a father and you project onto God what a father is. And, and maybe it's something where, because it isn't like how in the world did um, Democritus come up with all this? But maybe you have experiences in the world and you project it onto science and then it happens to be right or it's similar or might have truth to it. That would suggest some sort of um, connection with how things actually are, with how human beings are. It's interesting, because now I'm thinking about Forbach and quantum mechanics and everything. But anyway, it I always understand, um, so there's a bunch of things. One, before I forget, there was talk earlier about thinking about a subject and you can't really think about the background and how things present themselves as being and that makes it difficult to think about lack. I was thinking about, I was trying to do the thought experiment of thinking about a cat behind a tree it's actually really hard to think about a cat behind a tree because you just think about a tree. And then if you're like, oh, there's supposed to be a cat behind it, you have to bring the cat in front and then put it behind the tree and then it kind of vanishes. So whenever, so just the very difficulty of thinking about or imagining something behind something also suggests a phenomenological bias toward uh, the presentable, the what comes forth and that is presented. The other thing I was thinking about, I always understood um, Democritus to be suggesting that atoms in the void, it's not that the void is created out of atoms, right? Like it's something different uh, in substance or what have you, uh, and, and atoms are different. So if, if, if we follow that vision, then at the end of the day, you can't have a theory of everything. You can only have two theories. You can have a theory of two per se. <laughs> you know, ultimately that's all you can do. You could have maybe a theory of everything with a hyphen between every and thing because it's literally not every, th you know, every possibility. Um, but then you would also need a theory of void. And what's very interesting in Democritus is that, you know, he's quite adamant that we can't get to fundamental truth, you know, because it's beyond, it's too small. You can't ever encounter the void entirely. Uh, but, but, but that doesn't mean we can't get any truth. He does it. He's not like a, a 
epistemic nihilists, we can certainly make conclusions about qualia, we can make conclusions about th things we encounter and so forth and so on. But there is some dimension ultimately that is going to transcend our ability to fully access. And for me, what I was thinking about, um, oh, and before I forget, the whole idea of like love having some fundamental like being fundamental to being. This was a big dilemma for theologians. And if I'm talking Christianity again, that's why they had to make God a community, a trinity, because they couldn't think about love without relation. So then like God had to be three persons, one essence. So there had to be relation in God or there couldn't be love. And so they found that dilemma of needing difference. And then C.S. Lewis describes it as a dance. So there's another theological background, like trying to figure out how you can have love. And ultimately they concluded there must be difference uh, in relation. Um, but the thing I, I was, was thinking about is that, that that idea that in democracies you can ultimately only have two theories, like a theory of two. One, we don't like that. That's not very satisfying because that means there's always difference and therefore tension and we don't like that. We want that, you know, that illusion of absolute unity and then we can be, we can rest. But of course, that's the sort of rest of stagnancy, of the, of the noise, of the death, of the nothing. Um, but what's interesting is it's made me, I've been thinking a lot between the difference between explanation and address the difference between explanation and address. And just because I explain something does not mean I've addressed it. So for example, and I actually don't need to address and explain everything, but there are some things I need to do both. So for example, if I say, well, there's a meteor going by planet earth and it's gonna miss the planet. Well, then all I gotta do is explain it, right? I gotta say, okay, well, it's going by the planet. Doesn't really matter. It's got this uh, this curve and that's, and that's how it's, oh, that's cool. But if I were to turn around and say, hey, there's a meteor heading toward Earth, and I would say, oh, and the reason it's happening is because it come out of the asteroid belt, it was on this projection, I explain why it's coming, I'm gonna look at you and say, okay, well, we still need to address it. How do we address it? <laughs> so what are we gonna do about the meteor coming at planet Earth? So now the explanation may help you figure out how to address it because you know the trajectory, you know where you need to, maybe it'll be like the movie Armageddon where we're gonna put the, uh, the uh, spaceship on it to blow it up. But just because you explain it does not mean you've addressed it. And likewise, you can also have things you could need to address, but you can't explain. Like for example, if we're talking about the human mind, you know, on your wonderful paper, Cadell, on the mind is absence. Maybe we can't fully uh, explain how the mind operates, but we know it's there. And maybe it's some sort of absence that will always be an event that transcends our understanding of uh, the brain to, to fully get, but we still have to address it. And one of the great tragedies today is uh, kind of going back to what a lot of people were saying is that we think that if we explain something, we've also addressed it. But what's really interesting to me is if in fact in Democritus, let's just assume that something what he's describing is the truth, is ultimately how it is. Then, then the void is something at the end of the day, you can only address, you can never explain it. So if in somehow the mind is a void or more so than an atom per se, then the mind is something that you have to address. And the fact that it's a void though, does not mean you therefore don't have to worry about it because it is still something that needs to be addressed. Whereas atoms could be in the realm of both explanation and address. Uh, and sometimes you just need to explain it and sometimes you also need to address it. So I think by making a decision, so I think we have to get comfortable uh, with the possibility at the end of the day, it's almost as if today we have no possibility of a theory of two. It only could have a theory of one per se. And if that's the case, then you know you can see where all you need is explanation and then you'll have address because if you know where it came from and you know how it operates that's going to give you a sense of what to do with it but if there's literally something about void that is part of fundamental being then there is something that we have to address that maybe we can never explain maybe i'm not saying that's going to be the case i'm just saying that's a theoretical possibility but but even if we do explain it we still got to address it and acting like we don't have to address it Acting like we don't have to address lacks or different things is causing a lot of trouble. And if I just say to you, because, because again, if, if, if lack, if we have these associations, you know, if lack equals nothing and nothing is powerless, nothing is not there and nothing doesn't matter. And we associate the mind with kind of being this, uh, this nothing. Well, then we'll say, if you have a mental health problem, we'll say, well, it's powerless. If you just had a stronger will, you could get over it. You know, if you, uh, if, 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 if it doesn't matter, why are you concerned about your mental states? There are all these associations that will come with the void. Whereas instead, if we think of the void as something we need to address, you don't address something by saying it's not there. You don't address something by claiming it's powerless. You don't address something by saying it doesn't matter. And so we're going to have to develop skills of addressing. And to close before passing it on to Tim, it's almost like, um, speaking very, very generally, 
Um, science is in the realm of explaining, which we need because that can help us figure out how to address, where philosophy is more so in the realm maybe of addressing, where they, they need to realize that there are two different theories of everything, you know, two different theories of everything. Science is down here in the theory of everything with the hyphen, and maybe philosophy is up here with the theory of um, the void of speculation, and it's up here. And two, and never shall the two meet, <laughs> you know, never shall the two consume one another. Because once they do that, you're going to have this negation in the same way that there always has to be a relation between the theory of void and the theory of Adam, per se, the theory of of a void in the theory of science. And if the relation vanishes, if it goes away, if there's not the difference to relate, then you're going to have a zero. You're going to have a loss. Uh, but that's going to have to, you know, we're gonna have to adjust our expectations. Uh, you know, we're gonna have to be comfortable with uh, a possible theory of two at the end of the day. That of course could have overlap, but uh, you know, we that's not much fun. We wanna just get that state of rest where we can watch, uh, you know, Netflix. So anyway, so anyway, I've been really interested between the difference of explaining and addressing. And I also like the word address because what do you, your location has an address where you are, has an address. Addressing is if I address you, I help you find yourself. <laughs> I help you locate yourself. So there's an address. When I address something, I help situate it. So we need addressing and explaining and to know where, which fields, which operate in and at what time. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. There's so much in what you each have said that I would love to dialogue on so many of the points and certainly to seek further clarity. Gargantuan task to address this. To By address, is, is the word response something that can be used to respond to it? Okay. I'm getting, for those of you listening, I'm getting like yeah, sort of like, yeah, nods. I think so. I think so, maybe from Daniel. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, so to see about weaving together something, this, um, again, to pick back up on the notion of the noise floor, Alex, you articulating when we start to, let's say, uh, speculate, begin to play some music or um, express signal together, develops a lovely waveform. We, we have that beautiful up and down. And then um, if we can press it, we can bring it all to a new level. And now that what was previously new expression or novelty that had arrived at some pattern that now was turned to some sort of equal valuation it now serves as like a basis we can stand on and all of a sudden moving along i think that as an as an image is is really nice to um and of course you you put this together in a graph as well which is helping me uh, reference this imagistically a kind of um a nice way of of um pictorializing the uh, evolution of cosmos in some sense um, because of course there are so many of these um, stable or at least predictable patterns that we take for granted or at least and, and they remain so predictable for certain time horizons until perhaps it turns out that there was something we compressed out that was super important that maybe we should have left in and now it's destabilized everything so there's something precarious about it as well and what I'm hearing a lot in this conversation is that part of our hope in some sense is to be able to remember even to conceive of again what may have been left out of some way of relating to this constant dynamic of this very process. Um, in the context of evolution, it's and, and in the context of um, consciousness and the on the relatively mainstream materialist physicalist view of metaphysics, certainly in the philosophy of mind, although there's so much controversy and there's many different positions and there's a lot to speak for, um, we have something like an and an emergence or development of subjectivity out of something that really ought not be considered in those terms. 
now plenty of people will disagree with that you know you've got your idealists you've got your you've got panpsychists of various forms but the the fact seems to be that there is something a bit special about where we're at and we can look around into nature and recognize specialness there too but certainly um, developed complexity and emergent layers of well what are we going to call it um, constancy or which become environment ultimately technology that then enables a new playing field upon which to play new games matter you know uh, physics into chemistry into biology and so forth into culture Greg Enrique is speaking a lot about this but that broad picture of course is largely taught from from high schools that we have this great chain of being in that sense um, or this development of complexity from the perspective of consciousness what what is what is what is continuous and this is a question Cadell was seeking to sort of ask what is continuous between the the some essence of subjectivity or conceived through the lens of love for instance and this is how I go about it as well um, it seems to me if, if I was to be pushed to the end of asking for some linguistic representation of what seems to be the case woefully inadequate as that is it it seems to me and feels to me like a grand process of loving transformation because i can't conceive of another poetic way to reference the immensity of how much the desire for unity matters and simultaneously the necessity of letting that fixated desire go in order for that entire process to continue and evolve um, that there can be the possibility for that at all and so perhaps to pick up on this theme of address if i'm hearing if i'm hearing sort of correctly we're looking to essentially understand what is it about the and you didn't use this word, so please forgive me. So I'm not speaking for Daniel here, of course, but there's something of the ethical dimension that's contained within this, um, getting a shore and a nod of the head. And so how, like, what of our response to the nature of what is can be conceived of as in continuity with the kind of response dynamics that, that are present in order for there to be bonding and moving towards unity here and then um, emergent potentials or ex expansion and now difference over here from the phenomenological perspective i've used in my own um, sense making terms like confrontation and surrender to, to describe these modes of orientation and there being like two modes of each i don't think it's quite adequate to be honest with you um i think there's a bit more to it but broadly speaking again how we kind of um, stand forward in the case of confrontation in our own to do to to somewhat defend or or uh assert our own boundary and then a surrender of a sort of allowing allowing an in uh, ingression negatively we can hold on too long we want to assert ourselves when actually we should be following and allowing ourselves to become other and to accept within and conversely with the the less desirable aspect of surrender we're letting too much in when we actually need to assert ourselves or something like this um so that's my sort of uh there's so much more to say here it was not there, there's there's such a there's there's a beautiful pattern in here to continue to explore but but in my attempt to sort of pick up on some of these themes of how we relate to what about us is in continuity with dynamics associated with the becoming of being at what we'd usually consider an earlier point in history that from this angle all of a sudden yeah it's earlier in one sense but on the other hand is present in that it continues to realize itself through us and um what does that mean for things like no notions like alignment 
you know what does that mean for realizing the potential of how things can ring true for us if there's something about an understanding of our nature of of this fundamental means of transformation of feeling most alive in terms of this flow between connection and disconnection and affirmed in our participation and mattering as being that which which in, uh, undergoes that that process rather than has to attain some final i've got my slice over here and i matter for this particular finished product matters only in so far as it is valued by the process as it as it continues these notions of continuity this notion of continuity is important the final thing i'll just say in terms of some of the technical concepts of that i've been thinking a lot about is in the work of forest landry i definitely point listeners towards checking it out might leave a comment in the the youtube of this conversation or in the show notes when released as a podcast but in terms of considering the nature of self or subjectivity in this sense be looking at the interplay of the concepts of continuity and asymmetry and in the case of world or an objectivity where or the third person um, we're looking at symmetry and discontin discontinuity so a kind of consistent lawfulness and a discreteness associated with measurement of object here and there in the case of world and then in the case of self this this flow and a directionality to time and that we are here with the present moment and that duration is a, a wave that we are always on the cusp of and nevertheless an asymmetry in terms of choices being made and different potentials becoming possible as it all unfolds and that there's something about the definition of these modes of uh, uh, description of reality that um, and perhaps linking up in some way, although I haven't connected the dots with where Daniel's coming from in terms of the never the two shall meet, that there are modes of sense making, very least in language, in concept, which are distinct. And how then to relate to the fact that we're in here, except it's not in here, there's a first person, not necessarily experiencing it in my head, in a third person world where the language of understanding is necessarily different and we might have maths over here and music over here, how to have a harmony, how to have that come together. Um, that's a lot of what I'm hearing coming through again, um, but I just didn't speak to all that was present, um, particularly in Cadell. I'm looking forward to listening back to that. Um, all of you had so much to say there, and I'll finish it up. Awesome. Oh, yeah, I love the focus on love. Um, I think that I think we're doing some good recontextualizing of lack. I think I think when I when I hear constancy, uh, though I look like a hippie, my 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 tendency is to quantify in um, in more neutral terms. Um, that the constancy let me let me let me backtrack okay so this idea of self that's being brought up a bit um you have <laughs> bring us back to the equation <laughs> negative x plus x okay that be that's becoming and then you have zero is the being let's just 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 roll with me for a second here so process is the negative s x plus x. That's process. Then you have the equation, the, the, the sum, which is zero. And that's some sort of landing point. That's the new noise floor. That's the compression. That's zero. The perceived nothing that isn't nothing. The, the, the finality that contains the preceding equation within it as nothing as per, you know, perceived zero. Um, just uh, to, to, to uh, I wanted to move on, but, but real quickly, just about this becoming and then being thing. 
I was listening to a podcast between Bruce Alderman and uh, Lehman Pascal uh, yesterday. And Bruce was describing uh, some yogi who, you know, in meditating, and he was describing these five stages. And the fifth stage of, you know, realization, uh, you basically are ostensibly, you know, all intents and purposes, you're, you're dead. Your life functions are very low. You're, you're at a noise floor. And he was describing this yogi who's just like, you know, his students would find him in the donut store, just sitting there for eight hours, catatonic, barely breathing with his heart rate, like at fucking, you know, nil, just like in transfixed, like unalive. Now that's zero. He's no longer becoming, right? He's practicing the art of zero. And I wanna bring up that not all zeros are created equally. That there are, because of this idea of emergence, different kinds of zeros, different degrees or magnitudes of zero. And so when he comes out of that, and he was describing that people that go beyond level five, you know, arbitrary number system, but beyond level five, um, end up coming out of it with yet another sense of self. Right, that you emerge from zero with now you're another sense of self. So the process never stops. But anyway, uh, to continue on, uh, whatever. A lot, a lot, a lot of notes I wanted. To so Cadell mentioned absolute being and absolute nothing. Um, what is that relationship? Well, in my schema, to me, they're precisely the same thing. Absolute being is the totality, the compression which is absolute no relation. Relation is brought to zero, where you just feel like, you know, you're just, you're, you're beyond sardined, and it feels like absolute nothing, because there's no relation. Now, how, how the, the compression, the Planck star, whatever it is, how that then re-expands, you know, what prompts that, I want to say it's lack again, but it's more like Cadell's global brain lack. So now suddenly we're behaving as a single entity that lacks. And perhaps it comes into contact with another singularity. And that sort of relationship is like, you know, springs us loose. I don't know. <laughs> maybe there's God and he's like, okay, it's time. But I, I think that lack may be, or love or whatever that process is, lack may be the constant in that, um, anyway, everything I just described. And then with regard, there's just a term that I think might be interesting. When we feel love, we feel like, oh my God, I've known this person forever. That's, that's essentially a pre-entanglement, a pre-tanglement, if you will, that is caused by, in my view, like this, this preceding uh, oneness. And then, you know, we disperse. And then when we meet someone and we feel, oh, I was right next to you when we were sardined. I remember you, sort of, because we were like this. We were in this non-relata state. Um, Daniel, when you said uh, the cat thing, I found it interesting. It didn't work for me because I couldn't unsee the cat. As soon as you said, imagine a cat behind a tree, I saw the cat. I'm fucked, right? I can't get out of it. I find that interesting because the only way then to make the cat disappear is to make everything the cat. So that I'm the cat too, right? So then we come back to this idea that nothing is everything. The only way to get to nothing is to get to totality, where you do you have the total compression, where it's suddenly now everything, and then it disappears, right? Um, and then uh, let's see. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, I have the cat singularity uh, written down. Um, I just want to touch lastly, this is me being a little, you know, this is me playing my hand a little bit and perhaps being a little, you know, youthful and rebellious, but what the fuck is wrong with lack? Why, what, what's wrong with the pain of lack? All of these uh, 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 practices that are about negating the pain of lack, oh, the, the world is, it's an illusion. It's illusion, and that's how we deal with lack. Or it's this, or just focus over here, or look over here, or buy this. All of these things, from Buddhism to, com to, to consumerism, are about negating the pain of lack. 
what about just doing the opposite and fucking embracing it as what it is, the most generative, fundamentally generative substance, um, period, the generative substance, the generative thing, the thing that makes us do things, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so I like, I like this more sort of like, you know, whatever, uh, th this approach of sort of positivizing lack in that way. Um, so yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. I think, I think positivizing lack is, is where I am metaphysically and practically in my life. Like, I feel like even if I like look at like my spontaneous unconscious motion, even if I look at my spontaneous unconscious motion over the last few years, it, it basically has to do with um, positivizing lack, you know, like first exploring lack through fasting, meditation, um, whatever the sort of, it could be also playing around with different types of tantric practices, which are basically playing around with lack instead of filling the void with a certain substance. All of all of all of this, all of this is basically seeing a positivity where your ego spontaneously saw negativity. Um, and even that's the only way I can explain myself as a historical subject in science. You know, when I was talking about myself as a subject in science, sort of basically correlating my thought with a certain being. In order to inscribe myself as a part of that process, I have to presuppose that my subjectivity was filling a lack with studying physics, with studying biology, with studying anthropology. In order for me to study those things, they had to have been the form of my lack. So that's the only way I can inscribe myself in the picture. Um, Now, there is something actually quite, I think, philosophically deep that I wanted to share about the addressee and addressing um, that somehow I'm going to find a way to connect with what Alex was saying about yogis and advanced meditation. But this issue that OG brought up so beautifully about like the metaphysics of two and the explanation and addressing are not the same thing. I would say is the reason why I'm what became interested in psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis is not necessarily interested in explanation. It's interested in addressing the subject. And in order to like communicate that point, I want to share my favorite sentence from the introduction of Jacques Lacan's Écrit. So this is from Jacques Lacan's Écrit. Quote, but if man were reduced to being nothing but the echoing locus of our discourse, wouldn't the question then come back to us? What is the point of addressing our discourse to him? End quote. So that quote is so profound to me because it captures even the conditions of possibility for psychoanalysis, which is basically that in the pre-modern universe, our discourse got its meaning on the precondition that we were addressing a fundamental metaphysical being, God. But if in the final analysis, what Lacan's saying, that our being and our discourse is nothing but the e our being is nothing but the echoing locus of our own discourse meaning it's just humans talking to ourselves like there's no other being here it's just humans rattling around with our discourse so then the question comes well our discourse is meaningless and what's the point of addressing each other and that sort of brings that's how i want to connect this to the idea of yogis and the advanced meditators because the yogis and the advanced meditators ultimately conclude that 
our discourse is meaningless. And there's like the, the actual content of our speech doesn't, there's no one to address. Like that ultimately there's no one to address. Um, and then like, you know, there's this thing like where, for example, the last year I've been probably listening to Osho more than any other person. And the interesting thing about Osho is he makes certain really interesting claims in, re in, re in relation to what we're talking about. He says that his speech is just a vehicle through which he wants you to hear silence. Like he said, I'm, he said, the content of what I'm saying is meaningless. He said, the reason why I, he says, the reason I talk like this is so you might start to hear the silence. And then the other thing is that he said for the last, like, however long it's been since he's been enlightened, he's just been nothing. Like, he's just been the zero floor. Like, he's just been the... the... But then the interesting thing about when he describes his enlightenment process is he describes his enlightenment process as like the becoming zero, but then like Alex is saying about these levels of advanced meditation, um, somehow if you go far enough into zero, you come back again with a different sense of self. So like, that's what happened to him. Like he basically went to the ground floor of zero, but then he popped back up with another sense of self. So like the process never ends. He just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But like still like the process of going to zero and then popping back up as a different type of self, it's like, it's like a qualitatively different sense of self. Like, so there's like, there's levels to this, like somehow, like there's still like some like deep meta levels, like, and like, before I pass it on to OG, I just want to like relate to this idea that like, in the global brain, like when we're all relating to each other, it's like, like, again, Jacques Lacan's point, like, if we're all the echoing locus of our own discourse, then what's the point of addressing each other? And like, it's somehow related to the whole in being. It's somehow related to the whole in being. It's somehow related to this impossibility of relation, this non-relation. And like, that's how like, like my most sort of like rebellious, like my most rebellious aspect of my philo philosophical career is basically how everyone I interact with has this spontaneous metaphysics of relationalism. And like, they think relationalism is like, like everything's relations, not objects. And like, that this is so fundamental. And I'm like, I don't disagree with that. But to me, practically in my intimate life, in my day-to-day -day life, what's more fundamental than the relations is the fact that there's this constitutive non-relation. There's this impossibility of relation. And that's what brings me to a figure like Osho. Because it's like, he gets that, like he gets that there is no other to really address. So I'll, I'll pass that to you, OG. Hopefully I did what, you, what you're what you talking about, Justice. Well, that was, that was again, it was uh, wonderful, Cadell. And I, and I wanna apologize to everyone because no one has ever heard silence listening to me. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, you know, uh, also too, cat singularity, that might be my favorite thing. That's so great, I have the cat bus from Totoro in my mind now. Um, you know, there's something too, what you're saying about going into the zero and it's a new self. Well, if you think nothing is negation and bad, then you're never going to do it. If you don't think nothing equals a void that you go in and it's a potentiality space, well, then you're not going to go into zero and do the things that you're describing. So again, it's really, really important to understand that nothing is not nothing. It's always this, um, that it's a lack, that it's a void uh, to, to overlay the language. I also wanted to, um, is it Brajaya, one of these Russian thinkers, philosophers, I, they say something like, like it was just a thought I had where since God would be absolute being, but that would be absolute nothing. God had to create something to relate to because God can't exist. 
So at the point of absolute being, there'd be absolute nothing. So God's kind of forced to create so that he's not negated. Uh, that's always been a funny argument. I've, um, I've uh, an argument that I've heard. Um, something uh, on the other thing that Tim was saying about, yes, uh, addressing and ethics really go together. And if ethics is in the realm of, you know, how to live the life, how to live, you know, what ought one do, uh, if ethics is in the realm of addressing and it cannot be reduced to the realm of explaining, then you will have to develop the skills of addressing, which are arguably philosophical skills or abstract reasoning or different things like that. And if we cannot do it, we will struggle to determine how to live the ethical life or the good life. That's not to say that, say, for example, having explained to you why your neighbor is always angry at five in the afternoon because when they were a kid, something happened at five and that's why they're always angry. That perhaps can help you know how to address them, but you still have to do the act of addressing that is not going to be taken care of simply because you know that something happened when they're five years old. So getting straight the difference between, um, for me, address and um, explanation is quite important. Um, I also, um, to, to home in on, I love what Alex was saying, you know, what's wrong with lag guys? Why is it so bad? Lag's pretty cool. Um, what's so lovely in um, Democritus is that um, lack is essential. And I think one of the reasons, like, if there's no lack, nothing moves, dang it. And, uh, and, and there, like, you almost could say, I guess, that nothing is when no atoms in the void hook up. Like, nothing would be when no voids hook up. That's when there's a sense nothing, right? But if they hook up, well, then there's just void, right? Um, so here's the thing. I think a reason we don't want lack, want to get rid of pain, want to get rid of, is because we don't think it's necessary, you know, if you thought it was necessary, then you wouldn't want to get rid of it. We think it's arbitrary. We think it's something. We also don't think that there's any um, truth to lack. We don't think there's any like substance to it, that it's a because remember what it, where, you know, um, the the uh, nothing is what we got out of with the Big Bang, out of nothing. You know, nothing is what's outside the universe. Right. There, it's supposed to be othered. It's supposed to be gone. Of course, if nothing is outside the universe, why couldn't it be that the universe is in nothing? You know, why couldn't it be in nothing? Uh, but we have all these biases in our thinking to other it. But the key is that we don't think it's nothing, uh, that we don't think that um, lack is necessary. So therefore, so then therefore, here's the trick. If lack is unnecessary, it is therefore irrational to integrate yourself with it. It is irrational to try to learn to live with it. But if instead there is something that is um, ontologically indivisible uh, with, with the lack, well, then it becomes rational to care about it. And this, this has a lot of um, consequences all the way down. Because if, in fact, it is uh, rational to care about lack, then it becomes rational to understand the difference between address and, and explain. It becomes rational to look into the possibility of a theory of two as opposed to a theory of one. But if you think all these things are unnecessary, well, then it becomes um, rational to just look for a theory of one per se, to think that all addressing is, simul is the same as explaining. And this hints back to what we were saying at, at the beginning, that in fact, speculative thought is in fact the realm that scientific investigation occurs in. Because if you don't have a framework of the possibility of a theory of two, which again, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case, but if that's not even a possibility in your framework, well then what constitutes rational transforms? It becomes irrational to even consider the possibility of a theory of two. And therefore all the grant money will go toward a theory of one. The idea of mind being an absence is not going to get any attention because it's irrational to even consider that. And so we are always inframed, I suppose. We are always framed, inframed, pre-directed uh, by our speculative thinking. And so uh, again, if speculative thinking is replaced by non-speculative thinking, by if the, if the atoms replace the void, then the atoms will cease to move. But of course, if there's void and no atoms, that's a problem. There's, in a sense, practically nothing at that point. So again, the two, the two can't replace one another, but they also have to always be relating. And I think, too, to close, I think, um, you know, what you're talking about, we, there is, I think, a Deleuzean tendency uh, to say that everything is pure relation. But the problem, I guess, and you know, would be another topic to get into Deleuzean ontology. If, if, there's, if there's pure, if there's relation, but there's not a non-relation, um, that does the relating, then um, what, do you what do you need to address? What is there to address? Who are you addressing? You know, you're always, it, you're going to have a lot of explaining or there will simply be the showcasing of the relation. 
the expression of the relation, uh, but maybe not a very good addressing of the of, of the individual. And and also too, um, it, it is kind of strange to think about a relation without a thing. And also, you could also, I guess, go to the practical argument of does it work? Like if you go up to people and say, hey guys, you know, I know that you're having this neurosis and this, this insecurity and you know, you're dealing with this thing, but don't worry, you're ultimately just a relation. It always just feels like explaining to me because that doesn't really do it because, because, because yeah, maybe you're always in a relation with other people, but you're stuck with your memory of your dad abusing you when you were four. That is not transferred in the relation per se. So I'm always looking for something a little more Hegelian than delusion, but that's an entirely different subject. And now that I said something bad about Deleuze, I'll probably be a key. I'll probably be attacked by the whole internet. No one will ever want to talk to me again, but you know, I tried. Uh, anyway, Tim, uh, you know, cat singularity, Tim, cat, you know, that's the topic. Pick up on that cat singularity. I've got the cat bus from Ghibli films. Well done, Alex. Uh, so, so yes, yes. Let me mute. Thank you very much. I'll pick up on them cat singularities and how we should relate to them yeah i mean the uh the way that i've taken to framing interesting <laughs> using framing is that a relational process it's an aspect it's a departure from a kind of it's it's the map making then the framing i mean so is is the work of forest landry i i find his um formalizations of of this very very helpful so and just very simply um to we can consider the observer observing the observed we need all three categories um and in forest metaphysics these are distinct inseparable and non-interchangeable so um when i think of a theory of two and as you're mentioning you know daniel they're relating so becomes then a theory of three but i but then you know then there's a recursion of a kind and well we're just going to go round and round and i how many the um we are updating our maps in relation to the territory that we are i i and then i don't and one of when did we start doing the map thing like when did that come into play like that's super interesting is that something we can push back before the layer of culture before the layer of um you know um semiotic reference or signaling or or uh uh yeah the, the basic signaling of um evolutionary adaptivity or mate selection i mean are these maps is the are those cicadas when they're making their music braying out there baying out there rather are they are they relating through through lenses we can call maps or is that something we want to reserve for as i said a a, a cultural um term emergence that's it becomes all of a sudden looking backwards. Well, we're right here. I am. I'm at a bit of a loss, uh, and yet we'll continue to to contemplate these notions. I I have a very strong desire to um, to hear more from Cadell um, in relation to. Uh, the point about the yogis and the uh, the kind of non uh, 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 an acceptance of relationalism and then a uh, a reckoning with some n constitutive non relation i i can't remember exactly how you framed it um that there's something about the being as realized by the yogi for instance which is seems for all intents and purposes from the outside looking at the yogi to be abstaining from engaging in relations or something like this and i think i'm at some the limits of my um perhaps at the limits of my conceptual understanding if i'm wrong to recognize that state as 
again, not so much being absent of relation, but perhaps engaging with the nature of some noise floor that as discussed is not absolutely empty, but comprised of that which is ordinarily outside of our awareness and perception and that I mean it has been mentioned of course that the popping back out of that then comes with it an accordant sense of self which is now built on the platform in some sense of the um uh like a, a kind of uh, such a uh a, a at homeness with that complexity that it is just a presence that is not distracting from whatever one would then seek like want to pay attention to now i can chop the wood or carry the water again just immersed in in the beauty you know uh but i can still nevertheless chop the wood and carry the water and i'm doing so animated by uh, a much deepened appreciation um so yeah i i suppose um i'm where i'm currently at is is just uh rejuvenated with more to consider um yeah and appreciative of all that's been said no i'm not really speaking wholly accurately to to everyone's perspective but i'm definitely picking up signal and uh yeah, grateful for that. Over to you, Alex. <sighs> um, I love the maps, making maps of the, you know, the territory that is us. Um, there's actually a Deleuzian concept uh, re-territorial re-territorialization um, and that seems to describe if we think about that overlapped uh, overlaid over the self um, as essentially the process we're engaged in um, let's see as I think it was you OG who said something like oh no I think it was Cadell they they're, they're Oh, the impossibility of of the the impossibility of connecting with the other, or something like that. The the impossibility. Um, of course, we can connect with one other, two, three, four, five, if you're lucky, right, at a time. Um, but the lack is that we cannot fuck everyone at once. That's the lack. <laughs> that's the ultimate lack because nothing but everything will do. It has to be the totalized state. Anything short, I think I said this last time, anything short of everything is not enough, is less than everything. There's a lack there. So we come from this totalization. Anything other than that is going to feel, we're going to feel the lack of that. And so I think that that, you know, for people who have relationship OCD and all these sort of pathologized states of like, oh, is this relationship enough? Is this the thing? Blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, the reason why you're feeling that is because you can't fuck everyone at once, but you want to. You want to feel the total sublimation of total love with the universe that we try and get from whatever it is, meditation, religion. So we get it from elsewhere, but that desire, that lack is not pathological. It's merely a remembrance of a state that we occupied at one point together, or at least it's a sense of that. And that lack acts as that motor. Um, I want to say that uh, helpful for science. Um, love is beyond ethics, or love is sort of the pre. Love, love is the sort of fundamental grounding of ethics. Um, so you don't really need ethics per se if you sense this sort of if you live the life of lack. 
um, and interdependence and interrelation and the sort of necessity of one another. And you, that is empathy for your neighbor in my book. This idea of like siloing ourselves, the atomization, ironically, because you know we're talking about atoms to start this, that we, the, the, the great heresy is disinterconnectedness, disinterconnectedness, disinterrelation. That's the heresy of the church of the universe, whose one fundamental law is the interrelation, is the love, right? The lack that we feel. Um, I should say in, in defense of religions that uh, are, you know, uh, to counter the previous thing I said, in defense of religions who are attempting to avoid the pain of lack, guess what they do? They bring people together. So they're doing their job. <laughs> I can't knock that, right? They're in, in order to avoid the lack, they're bringing people together. And that in and of itself plays its own role because there's obviously two entry points to this. One is congregation and then the other is zero. One is becoming, lack plus, and then the other is just being zero. And both of those are sort of states, um, roundabout ways to engage with uh, the process of becoming. Um, ah, I just want to say that the this idea of, of, of of sort of a tripartite or uh, immutable tri tripartite vis-a-vis -vis Landry, if I'm understanding that correctly, I may be misinterpreting that, or, uh, or a duality or a dualism. The song thinks that the floor is silent, right? But it's not. In fact, the waveform is using the floor to oscillate around. Without it, it would have no equilibrium. And, um, and I think that you know, just as the butterfly does not see the caterpillar, <laughs> right? It doesn't see the cater caterpillar from whence it came, but there is a relation there. So in defense of the totalizing relationalism, um, I think there is an argument to be made um, that, that everything is on a gradient. We just can't always see it. And that's sort of the magic of the relief. Um, not sure. Are we, I, I'm assuming we'll do one more round in a, uh, of, of something at some point, right? Because um, this is getting this is getting really good. Um, For sure. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely have a, a the next round as a sort of a, a closing. OK, so in that case, uh, I will yield. All right. Well, the main thing I wanted to communicate is in relationship to Tim saying he wanted to hear more about me talking about the relation and the non-relation. I just want to quickly say that what I think the yogis are doing is they're realizing that the non-relation is more fundamental than the relation. And that what normal, what normal people are doing, quote unquote, is that they are looking for everything in one relation or they're, 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 they're unconsciously searching for the relation. Like they're unconsciously searching for the relation that would feel like it's everything. Like, but like, as Alex is saying, that relation is not possible. Like everything short of everything is less than everything. There's a lack there. So like, again, it's like that, you know, like that child, that, 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 sorry, that, that, that teenage love of like thinking that you're going to find the one. Like people are looking for that relation that would be the relation, but that relation is impossible. And what the yogis are realizing is that the non-relation is more fundamental than the relation. And they found a way to embody that. And because they can embody that in some sense, they can relate and fuck to everyone. Like, because they are the non-relation in some sense, they literally could like, like holistically sleep around with everyone. Like, like it's just, in some weird way like it, that, that that's like that's like kind of like a the superpower they gain from that now i think that's somehow connected to what i was trying to point towards with plato because when plato's talking about in the beginning we were whole the beginning we were one and that this is a memory this is a remembrance he claims that this is somehow in the mythological creature of the androgynous creature which is both sexes simultaneously 
So there's this idea that the human species is divided into two, back to like OG's point about a theory of two, and that the two are constantly trying to become one, but they can't kind of do it because like there's just something about our being that's impossible to make it into one. Now, what's interesting to note about even though it's physically impossible to become one, I think on a mental level, what the yogis kind of prove, and I think this is verified by psychoanalytic research into the unconscious, is that it's possible mentally because I know what Freud said about the unconscious is that fundamentally we're all bisexual. So mentally, it's possible to, in some sense, become the androgynous creature. So like basically what I'm saying is like maybe from a Jungian point of view, you would say it's it's possible to like combine your anima and your animus, or it's like possible to combine your, your masculine and your feminine side and to become kind of like the androgynous creature. And that would be basically to have kind of like, I don't know, a holistic relationship to all your holes or something like that. Um, now I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably end, end, end with that thought other than that before the closing, I just want to say that the point of this conversation was kind of to using Democritus as a starting point with atoms in the void, kind of saying that the, the foundation for a metaphysics of science is kind of still thinking in terms of atoms in the void, but what science doesn't think just simply because it is philosophically lazy is the void, is lack. And that in order to sort of make science more philosophically robust, we don't need to add a supernatural substance. We don't need to add... Um, some other substance that we can't observe and test. We simply need to think the way in which what we observe and test requires lack. And again, I would go back to that idea that yes, no matter how much you study the mechanics of what is, that doesn't help you understand the why of that substance or the potentiality of that substance. And so basically like, Ultimately, for me, my conclusion would be that the the, con the practical consequence of thinking a science of, of void or science of lack is that we would be, as, as a scientific society, bringing much more attention to the why we bring something into being and the potentiality of that thing we bring into being. So, and I think that that is more and more going to be important in the 21st century as science becomes more powerful. Um, so that's, that's kind of my conclusion. OG. Well, lovely Cadell. Thank you everyone. And uh, to Alex's point. Yes. Um, I I'm kind of in David Hume's camp where I think that ethics is primarily a result of sentiment where you encounter your neighbor and it's the face of the other that compels one into sympathizing with them. And it's that big debate him and Adam Smith had because the theory of moral sentiments that Smith wrote is really very much in response to the treatise of human nature, but he doesn't use Hume's name because Hume had the treatise of human, um, human nature anonymous. And that was just considered rude to, to name the person you're speaking to if they did the text anonymously. And in fact, I think we're fooling ourselves if we believe that the reason we're ethical is because, you know, we read Kant or something. Maybe Kant helped us understand why it's good to do this thing that we, we do. Uh, but, but it's not because you read Kant. And actually to a point, you know, we're actually having trouble. You were making the point as well that religion brings people together. You know, we're really finding it's quite difficult to get people to be in community with people they don't like unless you can threaten them with eternal damnation. It's really hard to get people to hang out and learn to like, you know, get the wrinkles out and to learn how to actually care about people unless you have some sort of, hey, there's a God up there that told you to do it. And that's actually, I think, proving your point, Alex, is that we can't say, OK, we know that guy on the third, you know, you know, down the street is a jerk. But if you read Kant, then you're going to treat him well. 
mm, doesn't really work that well. But when you say, well, you know, Jesus died for you. And so shut up. You're like, okay, yeah, this guy died for me. So maybe I should go do something. <laughs> and there's an eternal dimension. So that's actually a, a quandary we have that I think about quite a lot. Um, I also think it's interesting that religions had people come together and sing together. There's something about singing together that's magical. I also wanted to bring in Marcel Blondel's action because I think action is relevant, but now I would just be pouring it in from the top and it would be all crazy. Um, I also, to, to close all the theological points, it's always interesting to think about the Trinity as a dance where God has scars on his back. You know, you were talking about what's wrong with lack. Well, if you have this kind of cross in him, like the scars are why you're invited into the dance. And if God's not dancing with scars on his back, you can't be invited into it. So that actually kind of has a a theological component of thinking about the necessity of lack to be invited into the dance of, of being. Um, I think also um, when we're talking about relation, um, you know, oh, I, I did want to add, um, Tim, you were saying the point on if you have relation, you could have a, um, a multi a recursion. It is possible that you could have multiplicity without recursion because there would be, you would have maybe void Adam relation, but you would not have a, and but you would have, there, there's three ontologies there, but you would not actively infinite ontologies. You could have many multiplicities of the relation ontology, but it would not necessarily be a, a recursion. Now that Absolutely. all gets us. That's a better way to say that for yeah, sure. And, and that gets us into Deleuze. Um, so so, so let's say theoretically that, and I'm just associating the um, pure relation, I guess, a centralizing difference and so on and so forth uh, with Deleuze, and there might be better thinkers to do it, but let, we'll just take that ontology of pure relation. Um, let's say that that actually at the end of the day is in fact the correct metaphysical framework by which to think of people, that there are no um, non-relations, that, that that doesn't exist and then it's just pure relation. Here's the problem. What did we say earlier that we learned? We said that the ability to think about total zero is something super crazy that human beings can do, right? So you're able to think about total zero. And even if there is no total zero in reality, even if it is not out there, the very fact that you can do it means that you're also thinking about thoughts that need to be addressed that simply explaining that you're at root just a uh, pure relation is not going to address. If I tell you, hey man, there's no total zero out there, that's going to explain why you shouldn't think about total zero, that you shouldn't think about nothing, but you may still have self-doubt, you may still have different neuroses that makes it hard to stop thinking that way, and now I have to address it. So likewise, maybe Deleuze is correct on our metaphysics, but we're still, we still think as if we are non-relation, and simply explaining that maybe our ontology, and I'm not saying I agree with Deleuze, I'm just granting that ontological framework, explaining that that is your ontology will not address the thought of non-relation, that will not address those different ideas. And that's why I guess I was saying with Deleuze, um, or just that ontology of relation in general, metaphysics of relation or whatever fancy term you want to use to sound philosophical, um, that that feels, always feels like an explanation where if you don't get into the psychoanalytical or more of the Hegelian dialect or different things like this, uh, then you're not addressing it because we do think that absolute zero is out there erroneously. We do think that we are alone. We do think that, uh, that we, and, and thus have these neuroses and simply having explained to me that at the end of the day, there is no self, right? You'll tell that there's no individual, there's no self. And there's certainly truth that there's no rugged individual. You don't, um, you know, you don't, you, you exist in a society and so forth and so on and different things, but that, but that's an explanation that is not an address. And so there's work that has to be done. And then the question is, what does that work look like? It may change between each individual, but certainly some of the work is going to be found on the ethical dimension of which I agree with you, Mr. Ebert means um, a life of love. And so perhaps a way that uh, what the, hopefully what the philosophy of lack um, makes clear to us is a need to live, it, um, to integrate ourselves with lack so that we therefore live according to love, which can help people with the ideas of non-relation inside that cause these neuroses perhaps that can help them overcome into a state of, um, that is more loving. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for bringing up where I didn't speak with clarity about the coherence that one can speak about a ontology of three with certainly a danger there in one's formulation. But um, but I yeah no I appreciate that. Um, so okay to close then um, and just to respond to Cadell in the main. Um, it's, it's such a fascinating role, the role of the yogi, you know, the guru, the one 
that is in some justification position of being where the there is that is desired by those in attendance to get to and if i ain't there somehow i am lacking i am needing of the 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 teaching through the portal of the guru for the realization of my own becoming um now you know some some famous gurus have taken pretty concrete stances in relation to the necessity of the guru remember adida made a comment about the death of alan watts who had read some of adida's books and um was uh, proclaiming him as a, you know i forget the exact words but as a very very special very very special being and unique sort of realizer and alan watts they had it organized to meet and alan watts passed away just before he could and adida makes a comment something like you know uh a man will do anything to avoid satsang or something like this to sit with the guru in this regard so um but anyway it's it's such a fascinating position for so many reasons you know from from a philosophical point of view from from a power relations point of view from a societal point of view um and of course uh uh, in the context of so many of these discussions about gurus, we have sexuality and violence. I mean, all of this, the, the, the Osho case is so interesting because, of course, there were um, uh, eruptions of strategic violence on behalf of key members of his community, which Osho may or may not have had something to do with. Um, certainly he was involved in the in the uh, psychic dynamics like in that community that's for damn sure now um, that's separate from strategic employ and that doesn't look like it's ever been proved really interesting you know documentaries on Netflix or whatever um, how to conceive of what is most fundamental if we're speaking of an ontology for example of three uh, a triple in this regard i've always found it so challenging like just to think from a processual basis and then identify any particular modality as most fundamental so some of like what whitehead might articulate and you know he speaks about his work in many different ways um but in one passage in modes of thought he'll speak about the triple of process issue and data data effectively being like the raw well data information um that the process is in relationship with there's a certain outcome of that that would be the the zero that is not the nothing that alex is speaking about which then itself feeds back into the database now the noise floor for the process to continue so what's most fundamental in this when they all require each other i i don't un i don't understand and yet there are people who are using this language you know forrest will speak about um relation as most fundamental um, this is something I want to continue to to understand. I'm very much uh, a student. Uh, there, there's an element uh, in which I'm a very much a student in in seeking to understand just what fundamental means in this context. How there can be um, how there can be distinctness, uh, inseparability, and and um, uh, uh, not not interchangeability, inseparability, and distinctness, and then look to what is most fundamental so i don't really know so in response to it's like whether it, relation is most fundamental or non-relationality i'm feeling intuitively i see this as uh like a, a gradients one word but certainly a process to transform through and i don't quite get to have a conversation with my past self in some sense and i and in that there's like a turning left there's a turning around a corner and now a new vista is in front of me um and the history is barred from me and uh, and as is as is the future and um and i'm left in the presence of relationship and maybe the lights in um front of me or those who are holding um the like so, like take the example of the guru i'm not necessarily endorsing the necessity of them though we all need teachers and so that's a, to that extent obviously we need education we need teachers i mean i'm not 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 disagreeing with that it's like holding a place beyond a, a, a mode of relationality beyond what is presently 
realizable for the student um, that is in that inherently uh, uh, is is destabilizing or is beyond their the frame of reference used to communicate that presence felt and that relation felt but to even consider the 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 um the non-relation we consider it in relationship we have the the image of the yogi sitting in the in the donut store or we have the um the the crazy wisdom teachings that are delivered through relationship and there seems to be um well certainly onward need for reflection and contemplation on my part and i wonder if the language of what is most fundamental when a certain set of things are necessary and imply each other for there to be any sense of any sense to both the notions and any um, um being becoming and movement at all for there to be ultimately this is where silence speaks and there is no silence so we're just in that sense dancing and taking turns and going around in a circle with a new little bit of complexity and, and novelty each time and eventually we'll be old and die and if any of this has been helpful then there are some who are listening who um will be helped along in their own rotations of transformation um, and will either feedback or have onward going conversations um, and will feed into the richness of the ecology of what we're breathing in regardless. And, um, and then maybe the fundamentality again is that I return to the richness of the appreciation of the opportunity for expression in in community and and uh in relation um and that there's a wave of that to orient and so a return then always to awareness of the here and now in relation and yet for all those things said previously be too trivial to finish with just the word silence wouldn't it but anyway i have i have nothing more to add i hope that was at least somewhat um somewhat interesting but uh over to you alex thank you all awesome uh well interesting that we're ending that we've had enough of each other we had a lack enough time passed it's like, hey, let's do it again. Enough, enough of lack, and we want to do it again. And now, boy, we'll be, <laughs> I think it's time to stop, right? We've done a lot. <laughs> Isn't it funny, the relationship between lack and enough and lack and enough and lack and enough and the new floor? And we do, I do feel like we've arrived at a new zero, at a new final point at a higher order of zero than we did last time. And maybe that will continue. And the next time we'll feel like we arrived at a higher level of zero. And then we'll feel the, the lack and we'll get together again. We'll start the process again. Um, I like this idea of the guru. Um, if, if we think about the noise floor and the emergence of waveforms that end up finally compressing, a saturation of, you know, expression, not necessarily as a linear lack or desire towards, but rather as a, mag as a pull, as a magnetism. So when we think of the guru, already existing at the compressed zero, the zero, the equilibrium to which we are all headed. And the, the guru is already on the other side of that equation. But let's now forget the word guru. 
And let's just think of it as a magnetized zero, if you will. Edward Sharp and the magnetic zeros, right? I'm finally realizing that the name finally has meaning. Even though NASA ended up using magnetic zeros to calculate uh, gravitational swings on like a Mars a wind. Um, and originally magnetic zeros was a math, but this is much more deep. That the zero that exists on the other side of the equation is magnetizing the process, drawing us toward it. And that's obviously what the guru is doing. He's standing on the other side of the process, being and inviting everyone else to the process of becoming. And um, I think if we transpose that just simply to life and the idea of desire as a pull, rather than a, a, a magnetized pull to the other side of the equation, to the next transcendence, uh, I think there's something there. Anyway, um, uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, non-relation, I'm sorry to push this orgy metaphor, but I, I just think it's worth it. Um, non-relation is the total orgy. Uh, <laughs> and you can get there because you can't affect it or actuate it in the actual. You get there by skipping the actual and just forget the for, forgetting the process, or you do the process and whatever, you get to zero, but by being or staying at zero and having, um, having enough of zero lead to another zero, and then enough of zero lead to another zero, so that you end up pushing through uh, each successive, uh, you know, magnetic zero. <laughs> um, anyway, so that the uh, non-relation becomes the total orientation so that you get the total orgy uh, by sort of a negating of the process uh, of lack. Um, so you come back around to it. And anyway, it is, it is cyclical and there's a, a much better way to express that that I'll work on for next time. Um, oh, importantly, non-relational, non-relata, when things are compressed are timeless, immortal, immortalized. I think that's really important and one of the possibly the magnetizing force. Because when we exist in relation, in the actual, one of the great uh, fears, uh, is it not, is death, is the idea of non-being. And we so desire to transcend that, obviously. So much of our behavior is about, you know, even just media. Like when we're like, you know, oh, we're, we're in a uh, post-propagandized world. Well, media itself is propaganda of the immortal. Media has always been this sort of like eternalizer. And when, when, when I think of like what might be the magnetizer on the other side of the equation, drawing us into the process of lack and becoming, uh, uh, coming back into non-relation, it is that sort of stabilized place of timelessness um, and immortality. Anyway, you know, just saying that and you know, for any scientists out there watching it, my sense of time is that time is a measurement of um, intervals of uh, 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 differential elements, any, any interval, you know, but when you collapse intervals, and this is the case at Planck scale, by the way, that the closer you get to Planck scale, the, the further you go beyond the speed of light, the more time collapses. By the time you get to Planck scale, there is no time, right? So this is not like a whim this is true at at hyper compressed compressed shit, uh is timeless okay and then um lastly um oh yeah so i just want to drive home something that i said earlier that, that the lack if lack only exists if z true zero only exists in our mind and this idea of lack only exists in consciousness and yet the entire universe is expressing this seeming desire to continue to emerge to continue to complexify this is the argument for a proto panpsychism to me this is the argument because if if lack only exists in consciousness and yet everything else is exhibiting lack by way of continuing to assemble as if it's not good enough. As if what, the, the cell, you're not good enough cell? You need multicellular, what's wrong with you, right? No, it, it feels, it, it, it possibly feels some kind of lack. It's magnetized to the other side of the equation. 
it's compelled to be in a process of becoming. And if lack only exists in consciousness, nowhere else in the uni nowhere else in the universe, we can't find zero. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting argument for uh, the pervasiveness of consciousness throughout uh, the universe. And with that, I seed. Thanks. All right, guys. So th thank you. Thank you all for, for this, this second conversation. Um, I want to thank everyone who's been listening. There's been quite a few comments online um, while we've been live streaming. Cool. Um, I guess just for a final summary, this has been our second conversation on a philosophy of lack. The first one really used Parmenides as a jumping off point. This one uses Democritus as a jumping off point. Um, and really, again, the, the, the goal is here to be open explorers um, of this concept of lack as something that's, that's very practical and at the same time taking us to places in science and religion and spirituality that, that really touch on some, some deep topics. So thank you, uh, the three of you, for, for joining me again. And, and thanks to everyone who's listened all the way throughout. This is is definitely been a mind feast. And uh, with that being said, I will end the second broadcast. Peace out, guys. <laughs>